I think that's the spirit that comes with it. You can't fake that. You have to actually build an inherent nature of we can do more together. And a lot of people say it, right? And a lot of people can recognize, hey, this is something that's important. Being able to create it and get buy-in that actually turns everyone on your team into an advocate towards other people wanting it, that's the special sauce that can exist in any industry, in any company, in marketing, in not marketing. Like it's something that's just real and that's chemistry. So we hope you enjoy listening to this podcast half as much as we enjoy making it for you. Because we had a ball. Only real content is going to last. All that other nonsense is here today and gone tomorrow. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of Navigating Now. It is your humble host, Des Cole, followed by other host, Jay Bartlett. And today we have a super special guest. Uh, he's a former head of Nike Basketball Signature. Um, his name is Craig Lyon. Craig, what's up, man? Pleasure Good to have you. Guys. Good seeing you, Des. Good seeing you, Jeff. Quick Good question we'd like to ask at the beginning. What was the last song you listened to? Oh, shit. The last song I listened to was... Man, the last... I was just listening to uh, Blueprint 3 yesterday. Oh, yeah. Like, right. uh, a little bit, yeah, I feel like that's the last like, album I feel like I remember listening to. Okay, okay. Mine was just just uh, just to say it, mine was a hunt of the show by Nipsey Hussle. Never okay. Crossed. I'll give mine too. I'll give mine too. I was just listening to uh Star 67 by Drake. That's a strong three right there. Facts. <laughs> Facts. I mean I'll take put an album down, but yeah, okay, okay. <laughs> I mean all str- all strong albums, all strong albums. Yeah, so uh uh what's What's happening in the world of Craig as of, as of now? How's it going, man? Oh, man. I mean, uh, all kinds of things, but been a good uh, good time kind of transitioning out of, uh, you know, time at, at Nike and uh, getting ready for the next challenge and, and taking on, you know, new industry and, and getting ready to meet new people. So it's been awesome getting to, you know, chop it up and get to know you guys last couple of months and, um, you know, just enjoying meeting people and having conversations like this. So glad to be here and, and uh, glad to see you guys doing the work you're doing. That's been the most inspiring part of, of meeting you guys for me um, is, is getting to see your craft, which has been pretty cool. Definitely appreciate it. Man. Yeah, really appreciate that. Thank you. So because you, you should be in Nike basketball, the first thing I want to get a take on is your thoughts on Jerry Lorenzo going to Adidas to head their basketball division. Yeah, Yo, I mean, I, I think it's great. Uh, Jerry, I, I enjoyed every moment of the process that I got to spend with Jerry in the, in, in the work that he was doing, um, you know, with, with Nike and Air Fear God and, and partnering up with Leo Chang and team. Um, I think his, his process and the way that he sees the process as he was getting more and more into sport was fascinating. Uh, and, and his curiosity inspired me in the room um, as, as we were getting ready to, to jump into something new for us. So, you know, the ability for the, the talent and people, um, you know, that he's surrounding himself with, that, that's always been something that it seems, you know, he wants to raise the, the quotient and the, the power of everybody around him uh, in their craft. Um, and I didn't get a chance to do a lot of work with, with Jason, uh, but I know a lot of people from the past and we have a lot of mutual friends who have just huge respect for what he's going to bring to that process and his experience, both with, you know, the, the, the core brands, but also in his own ventures and, and what that's going to be. And um, I'm excited to see, you know, what happens. I, I, I think Adi does some amazing things with form. I think Jerry is, is about form, especially when I think about footwear, that, that's something I can, I can see, I, I know is his. Um, and I can't wait to see what they put together. Um, and, and that's going to be something special. We'll see how fast they get it done. Facts. Did you ever get a chance to work with him on any projects when he was still with Nike basketball? Yeah, well, they had already, they had already built the, the shoe, the Air Fear of God one and, and the raid. And, you know, they had the, the couple of other editions that were kind of built uh, in sportswear. So when I when when we really got into that shoe, we started to work on the back end of bringing the marketing work to life. But one of the amazing things about working with Jerry is that he is also a creative director beyond the construction of the footwear. So his involvement in 
shooting assets and having a vision of what he wants things to to portray that that kind of make this amazing mirror to the actual product process, which was maybe the most exciting part uh, for me was seeing somebody who could really play in both fields and do it with grace uh, and, and bringing people along for the ride. So um, that was amazing because also as a, you know, we were working across a lot of athletes and a lot of projects at the time and to have such a sound engine that we could look at to say, hey, let's let's trust this process. Let's go with this and, and, and watch what comes out. And I thought some of the retail that came to life, the, the worn backboards and things that, that came to, you know, you saw in Kith or in, in doors around the world was amazing. And, and people remember that campaign and that shoe for all the, those really iconic moments that you had beyond just that incredible piece of footwear and remember the apparel collection that, that came along with it. So um, really enjoyed it. Wish there was more time uh, for, for both of us to see, you know, what we could have all done uh, with that team that we had from the, the beginning. Um, but that only makes me more excited to see what he and this team can do, um, you know, with the power of uh, the engine behind him. Yeah, I think it was super, I think it is super exciting. I think Jerry Lorenzo kind of kicked it off um, with Nike is seeing like different creative directors and just seeing especially NBA teams and the NBA in general kind of take a likening to uh, having actual artists as creative directors. You see Daniel Arsham is now the creative director for the Cavs. Um, seeing Kith work with the, the Knicks and uh, I just think that's that's super cool. I think hopefully it happens more uh, in other sports, but I like to yeah. see that collaboration. I will say too, on a personal note, uh, that drop is probably my favorite thing that Nike's ever made. <laughs> I love the Amazing. shoe, the way that it was all put out. I think it, it was, you guys did a fantastic job with that. Well, like I said, I give, I give Jerry and his team a ton of credit for, for their involvement and their, uh, you know, their, their ability to put the engine to work in the ways that it was willing to work uh, and, and do something that made that kind of impact on you. I feel like that, that's enough for me to feel like we did, we did, we did a good job with that one. So thank you. Cool. And so your experience with brand is extends obviously and sometimes i feel like companies that are kind of brought up in uh in an industry that isn't so focused on culture don't necessarily always blend the brand with the company mm -hmm. um so i wanted to get your thoughts on like maybe what the differences are to you how they intertwine and uh, just your experience Sure. Um, it's interesting because I think the I always find there's a distinction between the brand and the company, but the core elements of what make those things what they are can kind of ebb and flow, which is why you feel big companies or big brands have that kind of internal struggle. They change. This year, it's a little bit more focused on the brand side. This year, it's a little more focused as a company because of a necessity, right? It's it's part of business's survival, part of business's adaptation, and the same things in the world of brand, right? It's it's the same kind of evolution. So, uh, you know, it's it's interesting to me in that I feel like the the core differences are when you think about a brand, you think about the soul of what makes it what it is, right? Your your the people are moving together towards a set of values those values are about the people around you and the environment, which a lot of people just go into corporate culture. I actually think it's interesting because I always look at it more so as if there's brand culture, there's an energy that buzzes around Nike campus, right? There is something about walking around that place that you feel, uh, you know, you're part of something. Um, that actually, in my mind, is more about the way the brand makes you feel than necessarily the way the company makes you feel. On the company side of things, right, there is a set of values that a group of people are driving towards. But those values are more delivered into driving the business and growing teams and doing the things that make the business grow on those sets of values. They're not exclusive to each other. In fact, the, the great companies are able to balance how they chase both sets of values through one unified group of people that make up the brand and company. And that's where I think it's interesting when you get to brands like 
Nike or or uh, or Adi or those that that their name commands an energy in both spaces, that's an incredible feat. That's an incredible notion that you have something that is both a brand and a company. That struggle can be real because it it, it creates tension in that not every move provides both sides of that equation what they need. And it's interesting because I think the circumstances of the pandemic, the way that the world has changed so much and we've all come to have conversations like this, like this, uh, it is it has forced the hand of so many uh, industries as a whole, right? To change the way they think, to make a call about let's zig or zag or change how we used to be or triple down on what we've stood for. And I think those are things that are, are interesting to watch because you're seeing which companies are moving from companies more to leaning into their brand, which brands are moving from being brands and leaning more into being the company because of the circumstances around them. Um, and that to me is the, the core of everything, right? We're, we're all just products of circumstance. What is my reaction to what, uh, what stands before me? And then how do we move on to the next thing to react to? For sure. Yeah, I agree. Now, one of the things I think you said was key is that the company and the brand is the same group of people and trying to figure out how to kind of like chase both sets of values with that same core group. And that kind of leads me into the next question, which was to you, I wanted to know um, what you think are some keys to build great teams. You've definitely been a leader in in your uh, in your career and we wanted to know kind of um, beyond just like the basics of like, we wanna do communication and relationships, obviously. But um, what were some things that you did that helped you to build strong teams? Yeah, um, it's funny when I think about the lessons and things that I want to impart on people, they all come from generations prior. They all come from like the first leaders that I walked into um, at Nike, who for the most part have all moved on and done incredible things in other spaces uh, in their lives. And we kind of follow that path, but um, you know, I think about uh, I think about creating a desire to raise the tide, to lift everyone around you. When I first came into Nike, one of the immediate lessons that I was struck with was finding ways to help the the people that were you know elevated in the in roles above me. But how do I help those people? How do I get better by making them better? How do I help them find the things that can uh, that can help a relationship with somebody else that maybe I've seen from my own experience? And that desire to have everyone in a team working together, everyone in a team wanting more and better versus competition for the next job. And I think that's something that's really hard to find because it's it's also about the people. Um, but creating that kind of culture is something really special when you're actually, when you, when, you, when you can get a group of people to be thinking about each other in that way, you now start to use all the nuance of the skill sets that you have. And instead of having five people, you have five people acting as eight because they're utilizing the fact that, man, I, this would take me two days and it would take you 30 seconds. And if you do this while I do this and cover your end there, and now all of a sudden you kind of get into this layered system where you operate as a group. And sometimes I think in, in any corporate structure, right, there is a desire to grow, to find bigger roles and more responsibility. And it can become about, you know, I want to manage a team, I want to lead people. And I genuinely believe you can lead people from any role in a company. If you're sitting at the same table and have a voice, then speak. And, and to me, that's where you can get people into a comfort zone because it's not about if I say this, am I competing with someone? It's about getting things on the table. And that kind of comfort is actually where I think great teams are built in their belief that you are a team. Think about every team sport you've ever played. When you got into a huddle at the end of a game with a shot on the line, there was no like phony emotion. Nobody was like, Am I still on mute on the Zoom call? Like there is no like halfway in in that moment. You care about it. At least if you were on my team, you, you sure should better. Yeah. Yeah. Like that, that is important. <laughs> so I think that's the spirit that comes with it. You can't fake that. You have to actually build an inherent nature of we can do more together. 
And a lot of people say it, right? And a lot of people can recognize, hey, this is something that's important. Being able to create it and get buy-in that actually turns everyone on your team into an advocate towards other people wanting it, that's the special sauce that can exist in any industry, in any company, in marketing, in not marketing. <laughs> like it, it's something that's just real and that's chemistry. And I think you can't fake chemistry. Facts. Chemistry is everything. And on that, uh, could you tell maybe a story where you were in charge of a team and you felt like you had really good chemistry or you just applied that well? Hmm. Um, man, I would say I'm flooded with a lot of options and a lot of teams over the time. Um, ahead, Doesn't that have to be just one? Yeah. You know what I would say? I, I think there was a moment, and this may be, this is a, I would call it a cross-functional example, right? Like I, I always loved when we got to the point where when I had a, a group of individuals each leading their own signature franchises or multiple franchises and teams. And we had to also, you have to remember that you were driving this business, right? And working with an entire group and team of people in unison with five other people doing the exact same thing, fighting for airtime within the Nike basketball sphere, right? Then things like, oh, by the way, Here's Jerry Lorenzo, by the way, here, but like, here's Adapt, new lacing, <laughs> power lacing shoes. Like that is, there's also internal competition. If you think about it, there's always so much air time. There's only so many things that are going to go out. And in those moments, when you had to get to uh, understanding what was best for Nike basketball, now put that on steroids and think about how Nike basketball was operating as a part of the Nike machine, right? And how... Nike was able to, to convey its messages and bring to life all of the stories and all of the products that come to life. And you start to see that you're operating kind of in these silos. But when you can break down the walls of the silos to communicate, you can create kind of this really special feeling where, hey, this is an amazing idea, but this franchise could be a perfect place for it to sit. And while it started over here as an idea for this business, it's perfect over there. Like, let's make the handoff. And now there's going to be some help from this side. If you were actually competitors, you would never do that, right? You would never be like, yo, this is great, but like, we should flip this over to New Balance. They would kill this. Yeah. That's not how that works. But within these franchises, because you had to create a unit, that was maybe the greatest lesson that I learned from a leadership perspective of, of that chemistry is hard because you are fighting the competitive nature that you're hoping everybody has. You're hoping everybody wants to win, but you're also hoping that they want the team to win more importantly than them. And that was one that I, I always remember when we encountered that year over year and I encountered it as someone inside the franchise or trying to help negotiate between, um, especially when there is rightful passion behind both sides. You know, and, and that's the embarrassment of riches that we, uh, I felt privileged to be a part of. The, the, the real power of Nike is the product innovation team. We always talk about Nike as a marketing company and there's been some incredible work done that bring human emotion to life. There's no question in that. I've, that's why I've wanted to be there my whole life. Uh, and that, that encounter is all built on the fact that this innovation team makes some of the most incredible things on earth. They are some of the most incredible minds out there and understanding how to utilize that and communicate and work together to bring those things to life, that's the, the special sauce that, that I'm hoping that, uh, that teams can find. So uh, kind of changing gears from here, I wanna know how you approach brand partnerships and influencer collaboration, because influencers are not necessarily a group, but are a big part of like how uh, brands and companies kind of collaborate these days. So yeah, what is, what is your approach um, when it comes to, okay, like we need yeah. to sit down and think about how this is distributed. Uh, sorry, I broke up a little bit, but I, I, I think I caught the question. Uh, 
I, I'm going to use like a weird, almost like, uh, this is like, these are the worst words ever, but I'm going to put them out there because they, they're going to tell you what I, what I actually believe is the, the root of great partnership. Um, mutually fertile soil. First, I, I don't know why I've ever put these words together, but I've done it. And I think about it as I'm looking for opportunities that these two parties could bring something together that no one else could that they genuinely see as opportunity. I hate when, uh, I've always kind of hated the, the root of like paid partnership and paid, where it's like, okay, I'm gonna, like, I, there's a big difference to me between partnership and collaboration, right? Paid partnership is like, I'm gonna work with you to take your IP equity, whatever it is, bring it into my IP and equity and sell it to make something that we can sell. Collaboration is, hey, we're going to come together to build something special that without the other side, I could not do alone. And I think that's where I always go. Like, if you're going to collaborate, you, you've got to be doing something you couldn't do by yourself. Otherwise, don't collaborate. Just, just do it yourself. So, yeah. so I think, and, and that's something that, you know, you balance, right? Uh, and in my experience, when you can find those spaces that, hey, we both want to be here. My favorite partnerships I've ever done, there, were no, there was no money exchanged. It was about, yo, this is great for both of us. Let's go, let's dive in. Those partnerships are when you're in it for the right reasons. Whereas, uh, you know, and, and you're actually collaborating because you've just both brought yourself to the table. Whereas other times when it's like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to throw this money at you so that we can do this because what I really want is to be able to put that little symbol on the back heel so that that drives the equity that I'm going to push in the, in, in the product. Um, and I find those to be really deflating. Those are the ones that end up being like hard to work on because it's like somebody's pissed about processing a pay. Like it's things like that that get in the way when you're like, no, like let's let's do the work. Um, and I think especially coming in to the Nike universe, right, with no background or concept in any way, shape, or form of the parts of a shoe and how it was built and what it takes to collaborate to build a piece of product having spent time in those rooms with partners, with people who this, that is the craft, it's arguably the most important IP that you bring in is something that actually helps make something better, something interesting, something new and different that the world hasn't seen that will put it, you know, put the industry on its edge. That comes out of collaboration. Partnerships can jack up prices on StockX on things and, and whatnot, which, which works and is a part of this game. But they're not built on the same ten tenets. Kind of similarly how we talk about brands and companies, right? One of them is driving one piece of the engine. The other one is driving the spirit and the drive for new and different innovation or style or whatever that may be. Is there, uh, on, on that piece, is there a, a favorite type of collaboration that you've done with that process was just like seamless or you really love the product that came out? Yeah, you're gonna make me single everybody else out like that, right? Um, no, you know what I'd say? Uh, I'll go back because I mean, I've, I've been super lucky, especially to have projects that members of my team have driven to just incredible heights, right? Like, I think about all the all the athlete collaborations with like with, with Paul George and PlayStation and how that's come back around twice and, and been a part of of such an interesting mesh between the culture of sport and gaming and sneakers and, and that world. Um, but I'll go back to, to Uncle Drew. And, and I say that because Uncle Drew was in many ways like one of the most complex partnerships I can imagine because there were really four partners. It wasn't a one-to-one, -one, right? It was Pepsi and Lionsgate. And I'm, by the way, I'm saying four in the sense that like all of this sits underneath the engine that was Kyrie Irving and team, right? And, and his vision, this was about, you know, his desire to, to do something with this incredible character and persona that, that he created. And, and that between Pepsi and Lionsgate and Nike, and then also Foot Locker, who was involved in a major way um, with how we did that. The fact that you had to coordinate across these four industries, some of which had worked together, but we had certainly never worked with Lionsgate on a major motion picture, right? We had, like we had built documentary film and, and done things in that sense, but, but this was a whole new ball game. And it took generations, I put it that way, of Nike talent and Pepsi talent and people to bring it from when the guys sat in the room to write a script 
to we're actually going to make this movie and we're going to bring a line of product to life in unison with it. And the coordination of that is like <laughs> impossible, right? I think a lot of the teams that have been, you know, worked through Space Jam, right, for this next time through are, are going through a similar process, um, which was interesting to see the beginning of. And that coordination and the people in it, that to me was what was so special. I have lifelong friends, you know, that came out of that. Um, you know, my guy, Jason Brown was at Pepsi when we started that, when the movie came out, he was well on his way to working at, uh, and, now, and now he's at Champs, he was at East Bay while we were working on the front. Like, it's been amazing because the connections and the people have stayed close in that because we were in it for the love of, of the project. And we were gifted the ability to work on this because of, to be honest, Kyrie's dedication and commitment to making a movie while doing everything else in his life at the time. Um, you know, that sacrifice, I think, is always overlooked. But none of this stuff happens. None of this stuff is real. There's no, you know, there's no engine. There's no give in that. And that was kind of the, the greatest fun in that every shoe that we built in Signature was a collaboration in my mind, because we were working with the athlete, the root of the whole thing. Um, and that was the most special part of, of Nike basketball. That was what was different. Our franchises had had families, had friends, had feelings. They were real people. Um, nobody ever asked the the peg 35, you know, how it liked how the peg 35 looked. You didn't have to go through that process. Um, that was a nuance that was, that was special for us. It's a really cool story. Yeah. Just being involved with that project, like that's great. Yeah. <laughs> and even like you spoke on like bringing like the intersection between like sports and fashion and culture and video games, especially like yeah. you worked in getting like the signature shoes into 2K20, right? Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. like that, and just having like the, I don't even play 2K, but I know that they have like the whole core, like the online cores and stuff like that. I think just that whole collaboration, like you'll probably be able to wear off-white just playing GTA, you know right, what I'm saying? Right. Like <laughs> just those type of collaborations I think are definitely like coming in the future. It's cool to see. No, I mean, 2K was, was an incredible partner to us in that, you know, there was a, a team dedicated to almost creating, you know, it was an entirely new kind of revenue to a company like Nike, right? You were selling digital files, essentially. Like that's that's a crazy yeah, yeah. Thing, right? and, and now you go into what, you know, 2K has created in the neighborhood and their desire to expand. And, you know, um, Ronnie Singh, Ronnie 2K, and I've known each other for years because we were always kind of in, uh, you know, in the, same, in the same circles and we'd have our yearly pilgrimage to All-Star Weekend where we'd get to see each other and occasionally get on the sticks. We'll leave the rest of that out. Um, <laughs> But the amazing thing was this has been a desire and, and, a, and an engine behind what 2K has been thinking about for a long time. So it's so cool to have been a part of that, that introduction, but also seeing how much it's evolved since then, right? As, as now eSport is an entirely different engine than it was when, when we first started. Um, and that brings a whole new level of real world, right? Like actual IRL product and, and things like that to life. So. I'm, I'm amazed with what that team has done. Um, I have some very close friends from, from the, my original Nike basketball days that have now joined that team at 2K, which makes me even more excited about uh, what's coming. Um, and and I, I, I just need to work on, <laughs> work on my game a little bit before I get back to those guys. <laughs> and then kind of um, back to what we were talking about with teams a little bit. Um, I know that you are like a, a brand person, but like you said, the other factions of Nike are what bring the whole idea to life. So I just wanted to kind of um, get your thoughts and like if you could speak to how you are very important, obviously, as the head of brand, but how those other teams fit into the larger scope. And I also wanted to make a point about like people kind of looking for careers in the brand and marketing space and how there can be a lot of different roles within that umbrella. Yeah. I mean, to say that organizations can be large and complex and are all different is just true. Just leave it at that, right? Even in small numbers. 
Um, I would just say that, you know, when I think about fitting into a team, you have to, you have to identify the large picture of what does brand marketing do in this scope and how do you interact with communications and PR creative and, and what that engine does in the sense that every business is different, right? Like, what are you actually doing? But your role in connection to these other functions is the big picture. And, and sometimes it's hard, even when you think about like, well, okay, like, let me just work, think about the marketing team. Well, sure. But like, if you're actually thinking about the macro, that's not even close to a majority of the entire population. So no, you almost have to just start to downplay your, yourself into, you know, the, the reality and just ground it there. It's not like you have to live in that every day, but understand that it's how you interact with your merchandising counterparts and you make the creatives who even sit closer to you. Think about as a merchant, you would never really end up going from being a merchant and talking to the creatives who are building it. You go through the brand team or the marketing team or whoever that conduit is. Starting to break those barriers is all about just thinking about it and recognizing, oh, you know who we should drop into this? These guys, because this is going to help us and them down the road be better at what we're trying to do. So I think just that, that consciousness of understanding how you fit into the larger picture is a macro theme that when you get into the brand marketing and creative space is dramatically emphasized. Right. And the one thing I would say that I always kind of not took, I never took offense to it because I always talk to my creative teams as creative teams, right? The, uh, the brand design, the, the, the arts is almost how I look at it. Right. And there is creativity at all levels of corporations, right? The, the ability to articulate the brief to a creative is without question something that's rooted in your ability to convey the emotions, the the new the things that you want to be, you know, uh, to be pushed into the work. That is an immensely important part of what the creatives are then able to do and go create, right? As far as the root of the word. Mm -hmm. um, but in the same sense, some of the most creative solves I've ever been a part of were merchandising exercises, were ways of figuring out how to reshape a line plan to frame it against what was going to be reality from production in coordination with a marketing team that could sprinkle that magic fairy dust on top of the new plan that's laid. And I think that's where people have to almost open their mind to creativity is not narrowed down to making film, writing words and printing posters, right? But however you want to want to talk about it, but there are layers to that. And as soon as you start to see that, then everyone all of a sudden has the ability to in turn be a creative and therefore feel more a part of the process. And in some ways, it actually can relieve a little bit of tension of like, well, where's my, how do I make my mark on this? Like, I don't want to just have handed this off and then bring it back and now I'm just a middleman. That's hard for some people. Mm. Yeah, but I think for sure the, those barriers are definitely being broken down between even just consciously thinking about what my job role is more than just my title. And 100%. those relationships or the conversations I have and my response, my responsibility to relay that idea into whatever I'm doing, that initial idea, but for sure, for sure. So the next question is kind of general, helps us a little bit. Um, <laughs> what advice would you give for a brand that's trying to scale? Whew. Um don't focus on, don't, don't make the brand about trying to scale, right? If you are take, trying to take something that you love the essence of, don't change what it is to bring it to more people, right? Then you've lost who you are. That, that, and, and I don't want to oversimplify my advice, but I have a tendency to say more than is needed once I've made my point. And I, I would almost leave it at that. When you are trying to scale, Think about how the, the values on the business end of the spectrum from the two things we've been talking about, how those things change and what it will take from the brand end to make that a reality, right? How do you do that? But never lose the values of what you've had on the brand side that made you something that you want to or are able to scale because that's what people are trying to get a hold of. I think it's interesting is it's, it's something that I think brands can struggle with as they try to 
enter being kind of a top tier, a pinnacle, like seen as luxury, whatever you want to call it, uh, you, you don't quite lean in enough to maintaining what's special because the ability to grow and get bigger is right there. But if you can play the long game and understand, hey, if, if we can build scale the way we want to build scale, then we can do it without losing who we are about how suddenly everybody can have whatever they want. And yeah. that is where you can lose uh, the specialness of what you have by trying to get it, by trying to get scale. Uh, I guess that's how I'd go. I think a little like follow up to that, I'd like to ask, I guess, handing the question a little bit more towards people our age who may even be thinking of ideas or wanting to start a business or seeing the opportunity that they can start a business and really trying to formulate an idea in their head and go from idea to starting to do whatever that process looks like. Just like personally in your personal endeavors, what was kind of your strategy in going from, oh, I, I say want to work for Nike. How do yeah. I go from that idea to putting that sequencing the process together to make that happen? Um, I, the one thing I know for certain is that the sequence, there's almost no way it's the same for everyone, right? Like it is, mm -hmm. it is so different. And, and I'll tell you that when I, when I first moved out to Portland um, after my internship, I lived in a house with, with seven other guys that were all kind of in ebb and flow different places in the process with Nike. And we had all gotten to that house very differently. Some of us had come through an internship. Some of us had been hanging around for a year, just waiting for somebody to something to pop. Um, and it was interesting because living that way kind of helped me understand very quickly, like there is no formula. Like I can't go to somebody and be like, here's how you make your way in. And it started to become, look at the circumstances around you. Look at why you want to be here. Um, I think that was something that I spent uh, the summer prior to my internship at Nike at Capitol Records in New York and learned a ton. It was a really interesting time in the music industry. And what was crazy is that as I left, I kind of had created like I, I knew I wanted to get into footwear and sneakers and I had always had that passion, but I, I at least knew how to walk into the room and be hungry to learn. And that was something that I, I had in, in uh in barrels full uh, in, in New York that summer. So as that happened, coming into Nike, I was able to convey my desire to learn. That was my intangible. That was the thing that was gonna try to help me hook somebody in that wasn't you know, looking for somebody to come in and, and network for six months and then leave. Um, and I think that became my, my advantage or, or, uh, or at least my approach. Um, that is what you need to find, what makes you, you in that room. And if it fits, then that should be what sells you in. Um, but being hungry for opportunity, I mean, you know, right now there's all kinds of new work happening. You can come into anyone saying, hey, I've, I've been thinking about this. I feel like some people use, they cruise a job board, right? Or they're like looking for the why don't you start with what excites you and go find those things and bring whatever creativity you have to the table to say, and you know, I just said that I look at creativity about 600 different ways. Go in looking at what somebody on the other side might be thinking of as a problem and spin it around, show them the opportunity, thread the needle. That's something that immediately can be like, I don't know if we have a job or not, but I, I need this girl. She, she's, she's a killer. Like that is something that, that you can show someone by virtue of the passion that you have and your own creativity in the moment. That's where I feel like people limit themselves by you're now only looking at what the things that happen to be available in the exact moment that you are on the search. I, I like my odds finding something I love if I'm just looking for something I love. And from my experience these past few months, I couldn't feel like I've I've more lived up to that, that hopefulness. Yeah. So uh, last question I, I wanted to ask was uh, storytelling is huge in brand and it's really beyond just like how, like we like to convey the message now. It's like so fast paced with the internet and everything, but just from like a fundamental standpoint, 
people learn and absorb information through stories. So I wanted uh, just to get your thoughts and uh, if you could speak to how you use narrative and storytelling with your work at Nike Basketball. I mean, short answer would be every day. Um, but I think the, the, the reality is that I think, you know, we were always, there was always kind of this, uh, this line between, uh, you know, we were able to tell stories about innovation and, and driving performance forward. And we we're also able to tell stories that were really focused on human emotion. I would almost like that was not how it was ever broken down, but like that's how in my mind I would almost say we kind of had these different gears. We had the ability to make you laugh, to make you smile, to make you cry. I'm getting Jimmy V over here, but like there, like there's a like there was a range. And I think it was when I think about it, we, there was the ability to tell the story in the moment, to convey that thing or that that feeling that you wanted to uh, to have at, at that very instance or. And that could be the NBA finals or the French open or, or just a moment in time, right? A moment in history, a moment for, uh, for the world. Um, that was very different than threading all of those moments together in a way that one brand could speak without seeming like we're over here, we're over here, we're over here, we're over here. Like that was the nuance. And it was the ability to, to navigate all of the stories, all of the volume between each of those silos as I kind of talked about it before and I think there's there's a uh, a simplification to that of just understanding how do you get all these stories out behind one voice uh and and I think that's something that is a challenge when you're telling a lot of stories but it's a challenge no matter what you're doing it's the flow between uh episodes right in the same way when you watch a show uh and and in some ways right a lot of the the content that you guys are looking at you're trying to weave different stories in and tell what's next and, and kind of move that needle along. So I think finding a rhythm between these individual emotions is maybe how I would describe a lot of how do you mesh storytelling and narrative, right? Because there's kind of these mini narratives inside of this large one. Thanks. I think this is probably going to be, or I think I kind of see being the biggest challenge for a lot of these major corporations, even even a little bit of Nike, because I feel like Nike is very much known for that piece of content that, especially the emotional ones, I feel like yeah. those ones that come around every, um, I don't know, just major event, whether it's NBA Finals or like the Serena Williams, mm -hmm. uh, one like that, super good at doing that, but um, not a lot of companies are able to do that as consistently as the internet kind of asked for it, per se. And I don't know if there is, I'm sure there is a little bit of power in not doing it every day, like everybody else kind of picking and choosing your times to do it. Um, but I think it's, it's pretty interesting to see how companies are navigating that content how, how often they should put out their content and can they find messages and are they able to separate those episodes quickly or how they're trying to do that. I think it's very interesting. Yeah, for sure. And then um, kind of the last thing, uh, you want to talk uh, to us a little bit about your new opportunity that you've taken at uh, Connected. Yeah, so I mean, it's right there. I'm I'm uh, I'm gonna move into the cannabis industry and and join a pretty incredible group of people um, at, at Connected uh, who who have really kind of made me feel like this is something that I've been moving towards without knowing for a long time. Um, the the new the the most interesting thing to me is that I feel like I'm going from working with some of the greatest innovators in footwear and product development and creation to some of the greatest innovators in the grow process and what it takes to to build some of the you know the greatest flower in the world and um, I'm fascinated by by what this team has done to date I could not be more excited about the runway ahead and there's so much change happening in the world ahead of us. Um, that I'm, I'm fascinated and, and feeling really grateful to, to be a part 
of you know kind of this wild west kind of this new uh new space um and and cannot wait to get in the mix with uh this team who has already done so much without me that uh, i can't wait to see what we can do together well said yeah the weed industry and legalization i think is something that's really gonna is really gonna show itself in culture over the next decade i feel like for sure yeah, it's gonna be wild. I, I'm I'm intrigued to see what happens in the world of partnership, especially right, because you're gonna be yeah, you know, new new space that you know it's it's one of those funny things about like there is timing, but there's like all these different timelines, right? That that all kind of have to weave together into you know the right moments to do the right things, and um, we're gonna have some fun with it. So I'm 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 hyped to get in the mix. Yeah, I think it's gonna be super in interesting because like uh i grew up in california and colorado so it seemed a little bit more normal that a lot of the population uh <laughs> used it but i think it's going to be super interesting the legalization process of like the east coast and like new york and like what new york's going to look like um because even like in colorado like there's more dispensaries than Starbucks, like <laughs> just mm -hmm. on every corner. It's it's super. Uh, oh, it's just very interesting to see. I think New York is gonna. I think it's probably gonna come soon, but it's it's probably gonna be the heaviest, probably regulated market. Um, but we'll see. We'll see. All right. Well, keep it out west for now. <laughs> that's pretty much it yeah um that's pretty much it yeah i guess yeah. we're kind of good on time mm -hmm. but uh overall thank you we're very humble to have you uh thank you for sharing your opinions and and coming on and it's been a pleasure to meet you and and we'll definitely probably probably see you in the future probably maybe have you on again um after you've had some time and in the cannabis industry hopefully be able to share some more ideas with us for sure it's been great getting to know you guys and, and looking forward to staying in touch um keep doing what you're doing it's been it's been it's, it's a ride but keep it going for sure for sure you as well man